Hey everybody, it's Nick Weiss, the lead pastor of the Fervent Church, and I want to thank you for tuning in to today's message, where we hope you're challenged, encouraged, and strengthened in your walk with Jesus today. If you have any questions about following Jesus or what the Bible means, please send your emails to connect at fervent.church, and we would love to answer those questions for you. Now, for more information about our ministry, visit us online at fervent.church, and remember, it's all so that people may know Jesus. The title of our message today is For the Glory of God, and last week it was the same title. This is part two, and so if you missed last week, you missed a good chunk, but I'll try my best to catch you up here, is that there is a guy named Lazarus. Lazarus was one of Jesus' friends, all right, and you got to understand this, that Jesus cared for Lazarus. He loved him. He, He was in his life, right? He not only cared for Lazarus, but he also cared for Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, right? They all knew each other. This wouldn't be their first meeting here, or first occurrence here, but Lazarus was sick, and we saw that last week, and then they, Mary and Martha sent to Jesus, um, hey, the, your friend who you love, he's sick. And then what we see with Jesus was a couple interesting things, because you might think when we're reading through it, well, Jesus isn't very loving, right? I hear from the church and the pastor that Jesus loves me and he died for me, all these things. And these are true. But when you're reading through the account of Lazarus at first, it could seem like, man, I, I don't know if he really is that loving, right? Because you see, he hears of Lazarus. He's sick. And what does he do? You guys remember? He, he waited two days more. Right? It's like, oh, hey, Lazarus is sick. We need you to come, Jesus. And Jesus is like, hey, you know what? I'm going to give another two nights at the hotel here. Right? I mean, it doesn't say that, but I'm just, he stays two days longer, now, which is very interesting because you'd think, well, Jesus, if you cared, you'd be pretty urgent about this and you'd be here right away. Well, he waits. And then before he's on, or while he's on his way, he tells the disciples, you know, hey, let's go to Lazarus because he's fallen asleep. Now, the disciples are like, well, you know, if he's taking a nap, Lord, let's just let him take a nap. He'll be better in the morning, right? He's sick, and he just needs to sleep and recover. But the Bible tells us that Jesus meant he was asleep, as in he was dead. And then he gets very blunt with them, right? Because the disciples didn't understand yet. And then Jesus says it very plainly. He says, Lazarus has died, right? Lazarus has died, and we got to go, right? And then if you saw um, towards the end of our study last week, um, one of the disciples, Thomas, doubting Thomas, right? He says, well, let's, let's go and die with him, right? Like, we're going to go there, we're going to die. And it's a very heated scene where we're at right now, as I told you a few minutes ago. This is right towards the last week before Jesus is crucified, right? We're in the middle of John, which can seem kind of like crazy, right? Wait, you mean there's 10 chapters on the last week of Jesus' life? Yes, there's more on Jesus' last seven days of his life than there is on the other 30 two years of his life, which is pretty incredible, but it speaks of the importance of what he was doing on that last week. And so there's a lot of tension. Pharisees, they're religious leaders. They're the church people of that day. They don't like Jesus. Why? Well, because Jesus is a threat. Why is he a threat? Well, for one, Jesus is healing people, doing all the things that, you know, they would say these are of God. And now people are going to Jesus because they're like, well, this guy's doing the works of God which he was doing, in which we know Jesus is God. Amen? He is God in the flesh. And so he's doing the works of God. The Pharisees don't like it because they don't believe that Jesus, that Jesus is God. So they're seeking to arrest him at the very least. They're trying to disrupt him. And, th- and what we've seen even recently is that they're trying to kill him. Right? They're trying to find a reason to kill him. Now, that's a hard thing to do as a religious leader in that day and age, and maybe as a religious leader in any day and age, because you can't just go and say, hey, this guy claims to be God, and I want to kill him as a religious figure in that day and age. Right? Because Jerusalem, Israel, was under the, um, the authority of Rome. Right? They're under the power of Rome. So Rome could punish someone to death. They could put in the death sentence and say, okay, yeah, this guy's crazy. He's done X, Y, and Z. He deserves to die. And they they would crucify him, right? Crucifixion was a Roman thing that they would do to criminals, right? But for a Jewish religious leader, they couldn't just put Jesus to death because they wanted to, right? And so they have this tension. 
right? Well, they don't like him, but he's doing these things. We can't deny it. People are starting to follow him, but man, we don't like it. And one of their biggest arguments um, that you, we've seen over the last few, I don't know, months even, is just that Jesus does something and it upsets them so much. And the biggest thing is, is that he heals on the Sabbath day, right? When he does a work, a miracle, it's the Sabbath day. And then that's the big issue that they had at first. Like, well, you can't heal someone on the Sabbath day. Remember, there was a blind man who couldn't see and Jesus heals him. And then they're in the temple. And then the only question the Pharisees, the religious leaders could ask is, who healed you? Right? Who healed you? And they didn't ask that because they were like, hey, who healed you? This is amazing. I want to talk to him and maybe give my life to him. Who healed you? Because it's the Sabbath day and there, ain't, there shouldn't be no healings happening today. Tomorrow, sure. Yesterday, sure. Today, no. This is the Sabbath day. We're going to keep it holy. No works of God. Right? And so they didn't like Jesus because of that. But then most recently what we've seen in the study of John and his account of Jesus is that they... They want to put him to death because Jesus, and this is their words, the Pharisees' words, you being a man, make yourself to be God. Right? Because Jesus was very clear. A lot of people will say, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. Maybe in the English translation, right, we read through it and we're like, well, you know, he didn't say, hey, I am God and those words exactly. But the words that he was speaking to them, I'm the bread of life. I am the light of the world, right? I am. He says these things. He's like, he's making a divine claim that I am God Almighty. I'm Yahweh in the flesh, right? And there's, and these Pharisees, they understood it. So for someone out there today, you guys are going to probably encounter this at some point in your life if you haven't already. Someone at work, someone you know is going to know you're a Christian and say, hey, you believe Jesus is God, right? And you say, yeah, I do. Well, where in the Bible does it say that Jesus said he was God? Well, take them to John chapter 10 and start to unpack that with them. And then you can start to see that he's making these divine claims. And the people of his day, the religious leaders, understood what Jesus was saying. Right? That was one thing they did understand, is that, hey, you being a man, you make yourself out to be God. What they didn't know is that Jesus is God. That's the big thing that they missed because of their hardened hearts. And today, as we're coming to this text here to see what's going on, I pray for you, for me, for anyone watching online, that if your hearts are hardened today, that God would soften your hearts that you'd receive his word, even it might be hard. Sometimes you hear God's word and you're like, mm, I don't know, I don't want to, I know it's true, I know it's right, but I don't want to do it, right? It's like going to the gym, like I know it could help me and be healthy, but I don't want to do it, that's hard work. Sometimes Jesus is like, hey, you need to stop sinning, and you're like, I know I need to stop, but I don't want to, I can't, that's hard, right? I'm going to have to have these conversations, it's awkward, whatever it is. I pray for you and me and anyone today that if God is speaking to you, that you would have a soft heart, that God's word would fall on it, that it would be planted like good soil, and that it would spring up bringing life. Um, and that's my, my prayer today. And we're going to see here with Lazarus, right, that he's going to come back to life. He's dead at the moment where we left off last week, but he's going to come back to life again. And so Jesus isn't finished. And so going back to kind of picking you up to speed, Lazarus has died. They're going to, to see him. And Jesus says this to Martha. Martha, one of the sisters of Lazarus, says that, for your sake, I'm glad. Now, again, we'd be like, oof, that's harsh, Jesus. Like, you know, have some, you know, bedside manners type of thing, right? What do you mean, for your sake, I'm glad? And what he says is, for your sake, I'm glad, because he says, for the glory of God to be revealed in this, that this is why this has happened. And I said this last week, could it be that the things that you and I go through, the hard things, the ones that you don't like so much, maybe something like Lazarus, a friend, a family member passing away, it causes you to just grieve, which is normal, but could it be that God allows us to go through some hurts and pains and trials for his glory? And that's hard to see past the pain, though, huh? Right? Anyone who's lost a family member, you know it's hard. Like, you know, like, and I think of, of um, my grandma, my dad's mom, like, when she passed away, it was hard. Um, it, but at the same time, there was hope because I knew she believed. One of the last conversations I had with her, I just said, Grandma, do you believe in Jesus? She said, oh, yes, I do. And so for me, I'm like, you know what? Whatever happens, and, and um, I'm good with it, but it doesn't take away the pain of losing someone. But we have hope of eternal life, right? We have that hope, um, but we're going to go through things. Death is certain, unless Jesus comes back today or in our lifetime, we are all going to die. I don't know if you realize that. 
I know that you can go watch all these YouTube videos. Hey, take this pill, this supplement, do this, red light therapy, all this, and you're going to live to be 3,000 years old. I don't know. It's not going to happen. Um, we're all going to die one day or maybe in, you know, who knows, many years, but we will all die. We're all going to go through hard things on, the, on our journey here in life. But one thing we can find is hope. In the midst of hard things, trials, pain, we can find hope that here even Martha and Mary, as grieved as they are, they can find hope in Jesus, right? That, hey, this is for his glory. And you might not understand that. Most times, you and I, we won't understand it right here and now. If you're going through a traumatic, painful thing right now, you probably don't understand it. And you're like Martha and Mary, like we'll see today. Lord, if you would have been here, this wouldn't have happened. Maybe you're in that season right now. Like, God, if you would have intervened, I wouldn't be in this situation. If you would have stopped me from going to that place, I wouldn't be in this situation. Whatever it is. Maybe that's your perspective of your, your life now. And it's hard to see beyond it. But here's the thing is that God can use it for his glory. And if he can use it for his glory, and this might be hard to accept or hear, but it's like, if he can use it for his glory, it's worth it, right? Suffering for no reason at all, like, it's not worth it. When you suffer for yourself and you're living a sinful lifestyle, like, there is no benefit, right? But if we're suffering for a cause, a purpose that's far beyond us, suffering for our Lord Jesus, for God, right? Like, it's worth it all of a sudden. He can use it, and as I said last week, he can turn it around. Um, and he can use what even you and I or people out in the world will mean for evil, and he can turn it and he can use it for good, and he can use it to glorify people. And what he's going to do is he's going to use you and me in these difficult situations to lead people to him, right? And I think that's when people are probably looking at us the most, your friends at work, your friends just in life in general, they know you're a Christian or you say to be that, and they don't really care a whole lot about it, but when you go through a trial, all of a sudden, all eyes and ears are on you. Let's see how they handle this, right? And when you're going through something that's hard, all of a sudden, all eyes are on you because God is trying to use you, use your pain, use your circumstance for his glory, to draw people unto him so that people may know him. So I know that might not make things easier for you, those of you who might be going through something now, but there is hope. And so we see with Jesus here, let's read, we're going to pick up verse 28 of John chapter 11. It says, when she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And we'll read through the whole text here, and then we'll go back. But the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out. They followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Just note that Lazarus has been buried even at this point. Verse 32, Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Verse 38, then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha the Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with the cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. 
Verse 45, many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Jesus, therefore, no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the region near the wilderness to a town called Ephraim, and there he stayed with the disciples. Verse 55, last couple verses, and we'll unpack it. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many of them went, went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They were looking for Jesus and saying to one another as they stood in the temple, What do you think? that he will not come to the feast at all. Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know so that they, so that they might arrest him. This is the word of God that we're going to unpack this morning. But again, this is part two of our study on the life of Lazarus and his sisters. And so again, last week, Martha had an encounter with Jesus. She heard about Jesus, that he was near, and Martha got up. She went to go meet with Jesus because she had an urgent matter. And some of you are like that, right? When something urgent, something hard goes on in life, like your first thing is like, I need to pray. And hopefully that would be all of us, and I know it's probably not. But when something happens, it's like it's our first resort, like, hey, I need to go meet with Jesus. Because it should be. And that's Martha. Like, I want to go get some answers. Jesus is near. I want to go hear him and see what happens. And so she meets with them. Lord, if you were here, my brother wouldn't have, would not have died. And then, but then she says something. But even so... Even so, she she basically says at the end of it, I still believe. And Jesus says, do you believe that even though he dies, he will live again? Yes, I believe, right? And so even so, going through these hard things, even when going through pain and trials, Martha's like, I still believe, right? And I love that because I think that should be our attitude that, man, no matter what happens, we might not understand it. It might be painful beyond all reason, anything that we've ever experienced in our whole life. But we could say, but even so, I still believe. I haven't lost my faith, right? Satan can take a lot from you, but he can't take your hope in Jesus. He can't take your salvation, right? He can try to make your life harder, and you can look at the life of Job, right? He had pretty much everything taken from him, but Satan could not take his relationship with the Lord God Almighty. And he can't take that from you. But here this week, we see the other sister, she comes along, and you might be wondering if you weren't here last week, well, why didn't she come when Martha went? Well, Mary, she stayed at home. And now I I presented my own theory last week, my theory of what I think happened with Mary is that Mary was hurt. She heard, I'm sure she knew Jesus was close, right? Everyone would have been talking about it. Martha, if she was a loving sister, I think she would have been like, hey, Jesus is here, do you want to go meet meet with them. And I think Mary, just from what we can gather from a little bit we see in Scripture, she loved Jesus because she, she was the sister who sat at Jesus' feet while Martha was making a meal in the kitchen, right? And Jesus said, Martha, you're distracted with many things. And Mary, she's chosen the, the most necessary thing, to sit at my feet and to hear him teach. That's really what it is, like have a relationship with Jesus. And I think Mary was so close, like in that sense, like you are my Lord and my God, I'll do anything and I, I'll give you my life. I believe in you. But then when you go through hard things in life, like a loved one dying that you can't explain, and especially for them, they're like, but you, were, you were a day's trip away, you could have been here. Right, And when you can explain it in logical reasoning, like, God, if you would have just been here, he wouldn't have died. I think Mary's going through a little bit of a struggle, and I would say she'd probably, I'm not ready. Maybe that's some of you today. Maybe that's how you grieve, right? You know you should go to the Lord, but you don't want to because you're like, I don't want to talk to him. I'm mad at him, right? But what we see here today is Mary comes around, right? There's another instance in 
We see verse 28, she had said this, this is Martha, she went and she called her sister Mary saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. Now Jesus is requesting that Mary comes to meet with him, right? And I think this is a difference, right? There's a change in this. And sometimes in our grieving, our mourning, the things that we go through, like you don't want to talk to God. I can tell you I, I've been there. I've gone through some things myself and I won't go into the whole stories of it, but I've been there where I, I just felt hurt by God. Like, God, you could have, we didn't have to go through this. Why are we going through this? And I didn't want to talk to him. All right, but then there's moments where it's like, you just know he's, he's tugging at your heart. Like, just come talk with me. Let's just come in. Like, right? Like, you guys been through this stuff? And I think for Mary, it's like, hey, just come, come talk with me. She hears that Jesus is calling for her. And so it says, when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now, we don't know if she went with excitement or if she went with fear or if she just went there plainly because Jesus had requested her to go there and she was being obedient. Either way, she goes. Verse 30, it says, Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. Verse 31, When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now, this might sound weird, but in a way, we can learn some stuff from this. When you're going through a grievous process, you've lost someone, it's good to have people around. And here in this day and age, not in the Bible is what I'm talking about, the Jewish people, they would even hire people to come in and be these hired professional mourners who would weep and wail with the family just to help them go through this grieving process. And I just want to, I don't know, for us, as we go through life, again, we're going to People are going to die. I know it's a sad reality, but it's going to happen. But when things happen, it's good to have people nearby to be with you. The Bible says to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep. And that's the body of Christ, right? We're not here to be all happy when someone's going through something traumatic. Like we're to go be with them and help them carry that burden through their life, right? You guys understand what I'm, I'm saying? Like you need people. And I know that one of the instincts is you want to cut people out go through something hard, difficult, you're mad at God, and then therefore you're mad at God's people. I don't want to talk to anybody, but you need people. God's made us for community to carry each other's burdens. And we see even in this text a little glimpse here. It's like Mary and Martha, even though Jesus was a way, ways off, they're still surrounded by people who cared. And now you might have a bad taste for the Jewish religious leaders of this day, which I could understand why you would think that, but they had their church family there. I think that's important to note, too, is like they have their church family. But now, it, just to, on this note, too, if you find yourself in a position where someone else is going through something and you're the person there, there can be a lot of pressure. What do I do? What do I say? And I just want to say just being there at all, not saying anything, speaks volumes. Sometimes you don't need to say anything in these situations, and it's, and it's everything. Just someone to be there with them while they go through a time of mourning or grieving could change everything. And so I just want to point that out. So they're not alone. So Mary goes out, the people follow her thinking she's going to go to the tomb. We don't know if they're hired mourners or if they're just people that care, but they're there. They're not alone. And then verse 32, now when Mary came to Jesus, to where Jesus was and saw him, note her first reaction. She fell at his feet. Man, I don't know. I get some like I get some type of feeling when I'm like thinking of that. Like because like I know when I'm going through times when I don't want to talk to God and then there's that breaking point where like I just I'm just going to go to God. Uh, and I guess I'll give you context, right? Those of you who don't know, our youngest son Judah when he was born, he was in the hospital for 2 weeks in the NICU and there's times when we didn't know if we'd ever see him again. And one time in particular, it was not good. We were we saw him and I'm sorry for like graphicness, but he turned blue, purple, um, and they said, you need to leave the room, and we left the room, and we didn't know if we'd ever see him again, and just so you know, he's happy and alive, so don't get super sad on me right, right now, but that was what was going on, and so for me, this was only, what, almost three years ago, um, and for me, it's like, God, like, I love you, like, we love you, we've given everything, like, we've left our house in Tucson, Arizona, our friends, our family, who we love, we left, left a church ministry that I loved, it wasn't like, hey, I, I hate this, I'm done with this, let's find something else to do, let's move to Texas, it's like, God had called us here, and it's like, God, we've, we've done everything you've asked, why is this happening, like, you know, 
And so there was a moment where I didn't really want to talk with God, um, if I'm honest. And then a friend of mine texted me, and it was like the only friend that could probably break through my like hardened heart at that moment. And he had been through something very similar. His daughter was in the NICU for like a month or two, um, going through very similar things. Didn't know if they'd ever get out of there with their daughter. And I just asked him, I said, were you ever mad at God? And he said, yeah, I was. He's like, but then I realized like how foolish that was of me. And uh, he goes on on some other things, but it really spoke to me. It was, again, this is the power of like people in your life that you need to speak those things to you. And then he sends me these three worship songs. Um, he's like, we just played worship. We cried. We worshiped the Lord. But let me tell you, the last thing that I wanted to do, I was a, I'm a full believer in Jesus. I never doubted in anything about him, but I was going through pain. The last thing I wanted to do was hit play on any of those worship songs. Like I didn't want to hit play, and I certainly didn't want to sing it. But you know what we did? I knew what I had to do. I hit play. And we heard this song, and even to this day, my wife's like, I hate that song. Like, it's such a good song, though. But it's like, because it just reminds us, takes us right back to that moment. She's like, I hate that song, because it was the moment, though, where it was breakthrough. And we literally, I dropped to my knees. I'm weeping, crying. My wife's crying. We don't know what's going to happen. And I picture very much here in this moment, Mary has lost her brother, who she loves. She sees Jesus for the first time after this event. And she says she fell at his feet. I don't think it was just like a, a very calm and just, you know, it was like she was heartbroken. And she's at that point where I can't go through this anymore. And she fell at Jesus' feet. That's what I think of. And that's what I picture what, what's going on here. She fell at his feet. I'm sure she's crying, saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. The same thing Martha said, right? Martha, she goes on to say, well, but even though, like, I still believe, Mary's more just like, just blunt to the point, Lord, if you would have been here, this wouldn't have happened. My brother wouldn't have died, period, end of story. I don't want to talk about it anymore, you know? But verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. What this tells us about Jesus is that Jesus cares, cares about you and I. He's, he understands, and what's beautiful about it, God becoming a man, right? Yahweh becoming Jesus in the flesh, and which is amazing, is that he didn't just, he wasn't just God and he was immune to feelings and hurts and pains. Like, the Bible says that he understood and sympathizes with us. Like, he went through life. You know what I mean? Like, if he got, if he stepped on a thorn on the ground, it hurt his foot, just like it would you or me, right? If he stubbed his toe on something, it hurt him, right? He was a, a human. He felt. He had compassion. He had emotion. But this tells us more that it wasn't just him when he came here as a man, but, like, he understands as God Almighty. So you just need to understand today, God knows what you're going through. He sees you. He's, I, he, when we go through these things, I feel like when I was heartbroken like, and confused about our youngest son and the things we were going through, it's like one of the things my friend said is like, how much more does God care about your kid than you? Like, you care. You love him. And he's only been here for a few days. Like, how much more does God care about your kid? And for me, I'm like, man, you're so, so right in that. Right? But Jesus, he cares. He saw her weeping. He saw the other Jewish people, religious leaders there weeping. And it says he was deeply moved and his spirit greatly troubled. And it says, verse 34, and he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And then verse 35, one of the shortest verses, the shortest in English for sure. Verse 35, it says, Jesus wept. Again, what speaks of his humanity. Yes, he was God in the flesh, but again, his humanity, he felt he cared. Jesus wept. Now this word for wept, I think this is one of, if not the only time, this specific word, I forget what the Greek word is, is used here in the New Testament. And it's one of those words like he wept and he wept quietly. A lot of times in that day and age, like to weep and mourn and grieve, it was like, it was a whole thing. Like it was a show, they'd tear their clothes. It wasn't a show in the sense of like trying to put on a performance, but it's just like they dealt with their grief um, a lot better than probably Americans. We just bottle it up, don't talk about it, go back to work tomorrow, act like everything's okay, right? That day and age is like if something happened that was traumatic, it's like you're ripping your clothes, you're covering yourself in ashes, you're weeping, wailing, like screaming, and you're just getting it out. 
because you got to get it out somehow. But here in this text, Jesus wept. It's that he almost, he weeps and it's almost like um, by himself even, but it's not a big show anyways, I guess I should say. But verse 36, the Jews saw this and they said, see how he loved him, right? Sometimes you can just tell when someone's going through a hard season and you see someone who cares and they just, maybe they break down in tears, maybe they, whatever it is, right? You can tell with body language at times and you're just like, man, they really care about that person or that thing. And here with Jesus, they see him weeping, man, see how much he loved him. But then verse 37, there's always the haters, with the good, there's always the bad, unfortunately. But it says, but some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? All right, and I guess that's a fair point. You're like, it's a good question. Could he have done it? The answer is what? Yeah, he could have. But like these guys don't know the context of what Jesus has said to some of these people. He says, hey, for your sake, I'm glad that I wasn't there for the glory of God is going to be revealed through this. See, God has a bigger idea, a bigger picture, a bigger viewpoint, perspective in mind than you or I. Right? Like, hey, you could have healed him like you did the blind man. Yeah, sure, but I'm trying to do something bigger than that. Right? Could we even try to think that way in our own lives when we're going through hard things? Like, God, you could have prevented this. Yes, I could have because I'm God. I can do anything. Right? But then maybe God's like, hey, but I'm trying to do something bigger than this through you, through me. Right? Sometimes like we think, well, if God's using us, everything's going to be good, easy, exciting. It's just going to be fun. You know, turn joy and all these things up to, no crank it up to 11. Woo, yeah, it's amazing, right? It's not always like that. Sometimes God's like, hey, I'm going to use you, and it's going to hurt. But I'm going to use you in a bigger way than you would ever imagine. And it's so that people may know me, so that people would come to me. So they bring up this question, verse 38, it says, Jesus, deeply moved again, he came to the tomb. Again, Lazarus has been buried here. This isn't like he died a couple hours ago. This would be a whole process, and this is, as we'll see, four days later. It says, it was a cave, and there was a stone that lay against it. So just picture the scene there. Jesus comes to the scene, to the grave site, and there's a stone that lays against it. Verse 39, Jesus said, take away the stone. I want you to note this. Right, in the midst of this painful, grievous thing, Jesus asked them to do something that would make zero sense. Right? This almost seems extra insensitive. Right? What do you mean, roll away the stone? Right? Even here, Martha says, The sister of the dead man said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Now remember, the Jewish belief back then was that the spirit of the body of the deceased would kind of hover around the body for about three days. But after four days, like day four, there's no hope. He's dead, dead. He's not coming back or she's not coming back. So they buried him now. He's in a tomb, right? And then Martha just states the obvious, Lord, like he's so dead, he stinks, right? And the, I think it's the King James says, he stinketh. Like, that's literally how dead Lazarus is here. And so for Jesus to say, hey, roll away the stone, I mean, don't you feel like everything in your body would be like, but I know you're asking me to do this, and you're Lord God Almighty and all, but seems disrespectful to the, the deceased, to the family, right, to everyone here. And Jesus says something, though. He says, take away the stone. He's so clear, so crystal to the point. Take away the stone. What does he want them to do? Take away the stone. Now at this point, it's an act of obedience. Jesus has put the ball on their court. Like, hey, I'm going to do something that's going to glorify me through you, through your trials. It's going to be bigger than you can imagine. But now he's like, hey, for this thing to go on, to go down, I need your participation. And I love this because God wants to use you. He wants to use your life. He's not just over here orchestrating everything and just leaves you alone with your iPad to play and be distracted. Anyone? Parents? No? Well, anyway, sorry. I don't do that either. All right. Um, <laughs> um, anyways, but God is involved in our lives, and he wants you to be involved. And so he would, he's going to come in at different points in our lives and give you very specific instructions. Maybe it's something where it's like, hey, you need to repent of this. Hey, you, you got sin in your life. You got an addiction you need to let go of. Maybe it's something that's good, like, hey, I want you to start serving at church in a different way. I want you to go check on that person. That God will put people on your heart where it's just out of the blue. I don't know why I was thinking about you, but I was thinking about you. Send a text and say, hey, how are you doing? 
I'm praying for you, right? God will move in these ways. He'll put the ball in your court. You want to be used? You want to see the glory of God working in and through your life? Well, we need to be obedient. And so they here have a clear, some clear instructions on what to do. Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus, verse 40, said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you'd see the glory of God? Right? He's referring back to their conversation. Right? I told you you're going to see the glory of God. Like, hey, I'm glad that these things have happened because I'm going to do something bigger so that you could see this and be, I don't know, astounded. That you can see that I'm not only the God who multiplies the fish and the loaves, but I'm also the God who calls the dead back to life. Right? He's trying to show them something here. And so he's like, didn't I tell you, if you believed, you'd see the glory of God. And it says, verse 41, doesn't tell us their response, but it tells us what they did. It says, so they took away the stone. They were obedient. And what's the next, right? He, he doesn't come back to life yet. But they roll away the stone, they're obedient, they do the little things. This could be a little task, but it could be probably so painful, especially if Mary and Martha were the ones who had to do it, right, rolling the stone away. How painful would that be to, to do that, this grave site for their brother they love? But they were obedient, they did it anyways. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. He says, I knew that you always hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. So Jesus is praying with the Father. He has a, he's a close relationship with the Father, you should know, right? No one's closer, right? There's a Father, Son, Holy Spirit. One God, three persons. That's a whole another sermon series for another time. But he's praying to the Father, but he's praying in this way, and he even says that he's like, I'm praying so that people will hear me, that they may believe that you sent me, that I am who I am here. Right? It's like Jesus doesn't need clarity on who he is. Right? He doesn't need to pray through this situation in this way, but he, he prays here. Um, and then he says, uh, verse 43, when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice. I wonder if this is more of just like a yell, stern voice, or if he actually is like, well, crying, like weeping, heartfelt voice. He says, Lazarus, come out. Now, it's very specific. He doesn't just say, come out, or hey, you who are dead, come back to life. He says, Lazarus. He calls him by name. He knows your name. He knows every single person's name. God is a personable God. He knows what you're going through, all these things, and I just love it. He says, Lazarus, come out. One pastor noted, if he would have just said, come out, what would have happened? Well, maybe the zombie apocalypse, and everybody comes alive. I don't know. But he is very specific with who he's calling out to come back to life. He says, Lazarus. Come out. And it says, The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. What has happened here? Miracle. Amen. Right? We hear of Lazarus, we're like, Oh, yeah, that was a fun Sunday school story, or I've heard that before, I've read through that passage. But it, do you understand right here, right now, this is God bringing the dead back to life? Right? Someone might be able to try and explain things away. Well, oh, he fed, you know, 5,000 people with loaves and fish, they try to explain away. They can't explain that away, but they try, right? Walking on water, well, maybe it was just a shallow pond and he was in the, the you, know, whatever. you know, they try to explain things away. How can you explain a guy who was dead four days, so dead that he stinks, right? This isn't a setup here. He's so dead that he stinks, they roll the st stone away and Jesus says, Lazarus, come out. All of a sudden, the dead are back to life, right? This is a miracle right here, right now. And I just want you to see this. This is, this is who we serve. This isn't something like, oh, this was 2,000 years ago. That's a nice story, whatever. This is, he's the same God today. Right. He's going to call every single one of us back to life. This is the beauty of it. Even though we die one day, we all resurrect again. Right? He's gonna, everyone's going to be resurrected. Some of us are going to be resurrected to eternal life with Jesus. It's going to be awesome, amazing. And those of us who believe in him as our Lord and Savior. Some of us, we're going to be resurrected to eternal punishment. Not so nice, not where you want to go, and you just got to understand that. Those are your two choices, right? You either serve Jesus or we serve um, the bad guy, I guess. But, yeah, verse 45. We're, Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, they believed in him. We'd probably be like, well, yeah, I, I mean, I would too. That's pretty incredible. I mean, right? And I don't know. It's, it's something, I feel like Jesus was very 
um, precise. Why did he come 2,000 years ago when it's hard to document things and all this? Because we have to have faith. Like today, we'd just be like, oh, let's just watch the YouTube video when he called Lazarus out, right? But then, if we even, even if we had a video, we'd be like, well, this is AI generated for sure, right? It's like we'd have, all, like, there'd be all these things, but it's just, it's incredible. But people saw this firsthand, eyewitness accounts, Jews who didn't formerly believe in Jesus, they see this miracle. They understand what's going on, that this isn't a normal guy. He's not just a prophet of God. Prophets don't bring dead people back to life like this. And so they it says they believed in him. But then verse 46, we got the tattletales. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what he had done. They're like, oh, Jesus, he's at it again. We need to go tell the Pharisees, the religious leaders, right? They can't even be happy, which is the saddest thing. I hate that. And even in our own lives, like, can we just be happy for people when God works in their life? Not, oh, you did it wrong, or you should have done, you know what I mean? Let's be happy, let's celebrate, rejoice with those who rejoice. Rejoice with the person who's back to life, who was dead before. Man. But they go to the Pharisees, they stir up more controversy. Verse 47, so the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council. Such a big deal that we got to get everybody together. Board meeting tonight, don't care how late it's going to go. Jesus brought someone back to life. Can you believe it, right? If I was in that board meeting, I'd be like, man, that's amazing. Like, what are we doing here? Like, this is, but they're so upset. And they say, what are we to do? They're still, they don't get it. There's people out there, God can do work after work after work right in front of you, in your, front of your eyes, in your lifetime, and people just won't believe. They're going to be hard-hearted, and you just... Some of you, you've probably been that person, right? Where God just, he, he was chipping away at you. Like, I know that's God. I know that's God. I know that's a miracle. That's him working in my life. But I still refuse to give him my life, right? But then one day you broke down. But there's people, a miracle will happen. They'll just chalk it up to that as a coincidence. Right? Yeah, I know. I said, you know, God helped me in this moment. But, you know, I didn't really mean that. But, you know what I mean? Like, there's one of my friends. This is a silly instance. But his car wouldn't start. Right, and his car wouldn't start. He's standing there for five minutes or so, trying to start it, and then he like hits on the car and says, "Lord Jesus, make my car start!" Right, and it sounds ridiculous, but he gets back in his car. He puts his keys in. You know what happened? His car started. I said, "You better say thank you." And he said, "For what?" I said, "You just asked Jesus to help your car start." Right? Like literally just happened. Like this is like I know that might not be what some people call a miracle, but I'm like, it wasn't starting before you, you asked the Lord to come into your life and start your car, and, and it's running all of a sudden, so I don't see anything else to chalk it up to, but people will deny things like this when it happens over and over, but these people, they say, what are we to do for this man performs many signs? If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe him, and the Romans will come, and they'll take away both our place and our nation, so they're Afraid. If they let Jesus go on, man, everyone's going to start to believe in him, which, of course, for you and I here today, hindsight 2020, that is the best thing that could ever happen. Um, but they're afraid of losing power, losing their nation, as they say. The Romans are going to come in, wipe us out, and take over everything, the little that they had. Verse 49 says, But one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, he said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. And now I want to draw your attention to this. Now, we don't, I'm not going to get into a whole study of who Caiaphas was, but he's the high priest that year. That's a big deal. All right. And that, whether or not, I don't know if he believed in Jesus, right, and his signs and miracles, but he's a part of this meeting for sure of what are we to do with him? This guy who's performing signs, he's doing stuff. What are we to do with him? And then Caiaphas says this, as the high priest, he says, do you un or, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. And this is interesting because this is exactly what happens to Jesus. One man dies for the sins of the world so that you and I, we wouldn't perish. Now, I think in the midst of this meeting, I don't think he meant it that way, but the this Holy Spirit was doing something, and even tells us that, that he did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he was in this role, and God's going to use him one way or another, and, and God speaks through him. It says he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And it says, and not for the nation only. So not just Israel. you got to picture this bigger picture than just Israel, bigger picture than just the Jewish people, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. 
right? So from that day forward, they made plans to put him to death. So this meeting happens. He says something so incredibly profound and deep and spiritual, and then at the end of it, then they plan to put him to death, right? Um, pretty crazy there, but what we can see in that moment is God intervened, or at least he used Caiaphas in a way to um, prophesy. And I think that's even probably not what Caiaphas wanted, maybe. You know what I mean? Um, he wasn't probably going in there like, I'm going to prophesy something so profound and amazing, right? But God used him anyways in this way because this is ultimately what had to happen. Um, and they think they're just getting rid of Jesus and their problem's over, right? Well, one man will die and the whole nation, we don't have to be overthrown by Rome and fear them, all that stuff, right? But really what's happening is like Jesus is going to die He's going to die for the sins of the world so that all may find eternal life. And, but they put, make plans to put him to death. Verse 54, last few verses. Jesus, therefore, no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the region near the wilderness to a town called Ephraim, and there he stayed with his disciples. So now he's not as open as he once was with good reason because Jesus knows all things. Uh, he knows that they're having this conversation. He knows what's going to happen. He knows what he came for, and he has a divine timeline. And just remember, this is um, right here at this Passover, the very next uh, verse, verse 55. Now, the Passover of the Jews was at hand. This is the last Passover. This is the most important Passover here as far as with Jesus' life. We've seen three of them, this, or this will be the third, I guess. Um, this Passover, it's like he is the Passover lamb. Right, and it's just it's we'll get into it as we go through, but it's so incredible. You should do a study on it, right? The things that they would do for the Passover in the Old Testament and the way things line up with Jesus' life and his last week of life and how he's even crucified, when he's crucified, all the things. It's just too crazy. And it just speaks to us that he is our atoning sacrificial lamb, and that only through him that we can have uh, be forgiven. Um, and it's amazing, but he doesn't walk openly because he's still got some things to do. He's going to meet with his disciples a few times. He's going to be teaching. He's still working, but he's, he's going to go at it according to the divine timeline, right? He's going to die um, on a specific day on the Passover. And being our Passover lamb, again, it's pretty amazing. But um, verse 55, now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up from the country to, to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. So people are starting to travel already, right? Getting a head start. Verse 56, they were looking for Jesus and saying to one another, as they stood in the temple, what do you think? Right? Like, what do you think? Um, that he will not come to the feast at all? Like, are we going to see Jesus? Right? He's a big deal. He's controversial in this day and age. Like, are we going to see Jesus at the Passover? And I think most people will be like, yeah, I mean, for sure. He's Come to every other feast, right? Why wouldn't he be here? Verse 57, now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know so that they might arrest him. That's the verse where we're going to end off today. Um, but this is entering in, when we'll pick up next week, we're entering into the last week of Jesus' life. Um, before he's crucified, before he's buried, before he resurrects, comes back to life, right? And so this is the last week of his life, which is pretty incredible, as I've said already a few times. But we're halfway through John, and half of his book is about the last week of Jesus' life. And I just think for you and I, it's like, what could be more important than just hearing about Jesus and what he's done for you and I, right? Just like he did for Lazarus. He called the dead back to life. He wants to do that in your life, my life, anybody here, anybody watching online. Maybe you, you've never found life in Jesus. He's calling you today, Right? He knows your name. He's calling you. You know in your heart, right? Sometimes I remember I, I gave my life to Jesus a couple times. You know what I'm saying? Anybody with me on like the several altar calls like took? Um, but the last time when it was like, like, I'm not playing around anymore, Lord. I've messed up my life. I know what the world has to offer and it doesn't have anything good for me. And I was just ready to get really serious about it. Um, I was sitting in the seats much like you guys. This guy was giving an altar call, and I mean, God had been speaking to me this whole sermon, and I was no stranger to God or hearing um, his voice and just knowing what I'm supposed to do, but yet I wouldn't do it. Um, you know what I'm saying? Like, that was me, like, um, but I'm here. 
hearing this guy preach, and then he's giving an altar call. And then the first altar call, he's like, you know, if you want to give your life to Jesus today and you want to say that you believe, you want to repent of your sins, you want to accept him and get salvation, all that good stuff, right? Why don't you stand to your feet and come down on stage and we're going to pray for you, right? And in my heart, in my mind, I'm like, I should do that. But what I did was I didn't do that. I was like, I'm just going to sit here. Well, this guy, I believe he was empowered by God because he didn't stop there. Right. He's talking to the people that came down for a minute, you know, encouraging them, praying for them. And he's like, all right, we're going to we want to give another altar call for those people like God's calling some of you today, but you don't want to get up out of your seat. I'm like, oh, man, that's me. All right. So he gives another altar call. What did I do? I didn't respond. I'm like, nope, I'm staying here. Uh, I'm not doing it. Right. And like some of the people there, like they knew I've served in the church. I'm like, they already know, like I'm a Christian. I, you know, uh, I don't want to do this. I'm going to look foolish. Like, oh, what's Nick doing giving his life to Jesus? I thought he's been a Christian. He played on the church band for the last three years. <laughs> or anyway, sorry, that's too much information. Right. Um, <laughs> but anyways, this guy gives another altar call. Right. He's like, if you're sitting in your seat, I know there's people. And this wasn't a very big crowd, maybe a couple hundred people. So I guess that's big, but it wasn't like a massive stadium, like, yeah, we all heard you, dude, like, just, <laughs> uh, but he's like, there's some of you, and we're waiting for you before we're going to close this, and he's like, you're just sitting there, and your heart's beating in your chest, like, you, he's like, that's the Holy Spirit, and for me, that was me, it, like, I'm, I, as he's talking about this stuff, I'm like, yep, that's me, I know I need to go, I've already known, the last two times you said this, I knew I should have went, my heart's beating in my chest, God's speaking very clearly to me throughout this, and so for the last thing, Though, it's like, he's like, I want you on the count of three to stand up, right? One, two, three. And then I stood up. One of my best friends, he gave his life to the Lord on that night. But it's like, it was amazing. But here's the thing. is like, Jesus knows you. He's calling you by name. But only you can respond to his call, right? It's like, when Jesus is calling you, like, Lazarus, Lazarus, come out. Maybe he's calling you today. Hey, you, come out. Out of the grave, out of the dead, dead, sinful lifestyle that you're in. Come out and find eternal life in me, only you can respond, and you know if he's calling you to respond or not, just like I knew, right? And so I want to give us all, all of you an opportunity today um, as we're closing out service to respond to Jesus' call, and that you would repent of your sins if that's you, that you would say, hey, Lord, I'm a sinner. I know that I need forgiveness. I need salvation, and I want to turn from my old lifestyle so that I can live from you, for you, and so um, if you'd all just bow your heads, we're going to pray. And, and uh, so, Father, I thank you for this, this time in your word. Lord, your word is good, it's powerful, it's convicting, Lord. And I just pray for each and every person here, every person online, every person that might be listening to this somewhere down the road. And, God, I pray that if you're calling us unto yourself, maybe we're living in a sinful, dead lifestyle right now, but we know at the same time that you're, you're convicting us of sin. You're compelling us to change and to repent and to come to you. And if that's us today, God, I pray that today we would respond, Lord, to your call to come out and to find life in you. And Lord, if that's us today, I pray that we'd raise our hand and that we'd receive you as our Lord and Savior, knowing that there is no other, that there is no life apart from you, God. And so um, go before us in this moment and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.